We're in Hebrews chapter 8. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Now, just kind of as a bit of a recap over the last chapter, which we looked at in, in two halves. Um, the author of Hebrews has been, uh, he laid out those arguments of the distinction between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of which Jesus is a part of, according to the, to the order of Melchizedek. And he has highlighted, he's made those two distinctions, he's highlighted the differences between the two in order to draw a distinction between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And he's now transitioning at the beginning of chapter 8, uh, at least in the first half of chapter 8, into a new theme within that overall context. He, we still need to keep in mind that the ultimate theme is the priesthood of Jesus Christ and the significance of this new priesthood. And he's going to be dealing with different themes. One theme is going to be the one that we're looking at today, the, the sanctuary or the tabernacle. He never uses the word temple, and, and there's a reason why he doesn't do that that I'll mention in a moment. He's also going to look at the theme of covenant, but not until next week. We'll do a little introduction in verse 7 where he starts talking about covenant. But then he lays out an understanding of the distinction between the new covenant and the old covenant in the second half of chapter 8. So today's theme in that overall um, compare and contrast between the, the old priesthood and the new priesthood is being seen through the, the theme or the concept of sanctuary, capital S sanctuary, or the tabernacle. And, and just as a side note, it's some believe that the word temple is never used in this book because it would have been very dangerous for him to basically be saying, the temple is going away, uh, which is what he's basically saying. Temple worship and the Levitical priesthood and the, and the animal sacrifices and the Old Covenant, that's all going away. It's probably dangerous for him to talk about the ultimate demise of the temple because if, if you believe along these lines, and, and I do, that it was written probably somewhere between about A.D. 66 and A.D. 70, which was the time of the first Jewish rebellion when the war was on between Judaism and the Roman Empire, which ultimately ended in the destruction of the temple. And if he comes along and preaches a sermon in which one of the main points is that the term of the temple is going away and we don't need to worry about it, it kind of feels a, a little bit too blasphemous. So he, he talks about sanctuary, earthly sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary, and he does talk about tabernacle. He does use that word tabernacle. Well, the tabernacle is the, it's the pre-temple thing. It's, it's the thing that was carried around. It's the big giant divine tent that the children of Israel carried around in the Sinai Desert. Um, in order to have a place where God would uh, come directly and encounter his people. And then the temple, uh, the first temple built by Solomon in Jerusalem, and the second temple was begun by Ezra and then uh, was expanded upon by uh, Herod. Uh, that one is, uh, the war is on between Judaism and Rome between AD 66 and 70, so it, it might be a little bit dodgy for him to actually come along and say, what he's actually saying, which is this stuff is disappearing and going away, and you shouldn't be too worried about it. Uh, so he, he just uses different language. It's kind of like saying if you, um, if you have a problem with ordaining women to the gospel ministry, then we'll just give it a different term, uh, which I've encountered that as well. So that's probably why, probably why he never actually uses the word temple. Could somebody read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 8? <clears throat> now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do not, we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord not by a mere man being. In that opening phrase, my translation has, now the main point is also. Does somebody have something other than main point? Is everybody main point? Now of these things which we have spoken, this is the sum. This is the sum. I'm assuming S-U-M, not S-O-M-E. S-U-M. S-U-M. Does anybody have anything different? It's the opening word in the Greek, uh, which the, the root of that word is kephale, which means head, 
or a crown. And, and main point is not a bad way, or sun is not a bad way of, of translating it, but probably the best way of expressing it is this is the crowning affirmation. In other words, he is, he's, he's preaching a sermon, he's ended chapter 7, and then he pauses. And then he gets jade or, or crank up the volume, and he says, now listen up. This is the main point. Grasp this. Everybody focus, listen, pay attention. This is the key. Not just to chapter 7 and chapter 8, but we're starting to build uh, toward the main concept that he wants us uh, to grasp. Uh, so this is one of those, uh, kind of like where Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, in other words, this is scriptural, this is authoritative. Sit up, you know, push yourself to the edge of your chair, crane your head forward, listen, cup your ear, whatever you need to do. Listen to what I have to say. This is key. And his main two points are, uh, and they are very profound points, we have this high priest, not the Levitical high priest. We have this high priest, he says, that I've been talking about over the last chapter or so. We have that type of high priest. And then his other point is, and that high priest is ministering for us right now. And we can say that today, 2,000 years later. We have this high priest of the order of Melchizedek, the high priest that meets all of these requirements that he's been discussing over the last chapter. That's our high priest right now with immediate access. You don't have to sit around and wait for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, in which all of our sins will be gathered up and sacrifices performed on our behalf. Right now we have access. When we prayed earlier, when we pray in the worship service um, in, in a bit, we don't have to wait for our prayers to eventually drift up to God and hope that they get there. We have immediate access to the Father because the Son is right there. We have immediate continual 24 7 as we say nowadays access to the heavenly father which is exactly what he wants and it's exactly what jesus has achieved and he's it's part of that contrast between the old high priest the old priestly system and this new high priest we don't have full immediate continual access in the levitical priesthood we have that now and then he starts developing some ideas of what this type of priesthood does, uh, his, his functions, not so much his office, not so much his right or privilege or responsibility in holding that position, but rather when you, when you make the statement, we have this high priest, it begs the question, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, he's going to deal with a little bit of that, and, and hopefully we will as well. And, but one of the things that he talks about in verse uh, 1 is, he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Why is it significant that Jesus, as high priest, is at the right hand of God's throne? Why would he even mention that? What's the point? Are you asking? I am asking. Question mark. Why, why does he mention that Jesus has ascended up to his father from which he came? And, and is at the right hand of... He's at the right hand. Uh-huh. Because... The right is considered as being the uh, determination of righteousness and rule in righteousness. That okay. does not put out the head. Okay. Anyone else? Why is he there at the right hand of the Father? What's the point? Maybe because, it's just me thinking, uh, but maybe it's because high priests were anointed by men, but he was anointed by God, so he's at the right hand of God right now, so that's what makes it different than earthly priests, that he's already in the reality of where the Jews and we will all go at one time, because he has that place before he came down to earth, returned back to the right hand. Okay. Well, in our, our high priest, the high priest intercedes for us in, in speaking to God. And to say that Jesus is at God's right hand elevates that function and shows how powerful Jesus is as our high priest because he's sitting there right next to God mm -hmm. on his right hand, which is the side of power. Mm -hmm. It's a position of authority. It's also a position of judgment. It's also a position of honor. Remember, 
uh, the, the sons of thunder, uh, James and John, and what, what do they ask Jesus? And one of us wants to be able to sit on the right, sit on the left when you've entered into your kingdom. And you, it doesn't really come out in the text, but I have a feeling since I have an older brother and I know what it's like to have a brother and <laughs> level of competition, they were probably jockeying for who's going to be on Jesus' right, the position of honor and the position of privilege and the position of authority and the position of judgment. Does it also validate the changing of the law? How so? Well, he's telling them we're changing the law according to the mm -hmm. And this is, he's on, he's deserved, or he's sitting on the right side, right hand of God, which validates what he's done mm -hmm. because it's with God. So this is saying, hey, you know, here it is. He's right with God. So valid, his sacrifice is valid. And therefore the law changes because of the fact that he's sitting on the right hand right hand side of God. Absolutely. It's, it's that clear affirmation. He's right there at the right hand of the Father. Therefore, he is, he has accomplished what the Father has uh, asked him to accomplish. It has been accomplished, and he's doing his ministry and his service. It says a couple of things uh, when describing Jesus as the right hand of the Father. It describes where he is, and it also describes, as we say in Texas, where he ain't. He's there in heaven with the Father. And he's not here on earth. Which, and, and it's within the context of the, the priesthood and the sanctuary discussion that he's about to begin. Which means he's not here in the earthly sanctuary. He's not doing the Levitical priest thing. He's doing the Melchizedek priest thing. Um, in the heavenly sanctuary. So it's where he is and it's where he isn't. And it's where he has the authority to be because of what he has done. Because he has been faithful and fully committed to the Father. Because of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, he has been elevated above the heavenlies and been placed into this position of honor and authority and judgment. He has earned the right, and he's the only one who has earned the right to be there. And it also says something that we already mentioned in regard to time. He's there. Now, we don't sit and wait for Yom Kippur. We don't sit and wait for that one day of the year in which the high priest eventually perform sacrifices for himself so that he can be fully cleansed of his sin and then gathers up the, the sins of the people. It, he's there now, always, continually, repeatedly, excessively, perpetually. Um, it's connected back to that theme that the author of Hebrews was dealing with in chapter 7. It is a perpetual priesthood. It does not end, ever, ever, ever end. Now, forever, and always. He will always be our high priest. He will always be interceding for us. Not on earth, but in the heavenlies. Now, just parenthetically, I'm not saying, and the author of Hebrews is not saying that Jesus is not here in this room. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I also. Jesus said that himself. Um, where, where a few believers gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, he is there in their midst. So we don't have to worry about that uh, theological discussion of God's transcendence and his eminence. Whether he's only there or only here, he's in both places. I have a question. Yes. You said he's going to be there forever. Yes. Does he need to be there after the second coming? That's a good question. What do you all think? What's, what do you mean by the question? Um, when the second coming occurs and we are changed and transformed or we are, uh, as uh, the dead in Christ, raised and gathered with Christ and he takes us into uh, heaven to be with him, will Jesus function as high priest cease? No. Okay, I got some no's. Do I have any yeses? Yes. There's people that are here that will become saved after all the rest of us are gone. So we still need to be, be there to work for them. But you mean after we die or well, I mean, after the, um, the consummation? Between the rapture and the judgment, I think is what she right. said. Okay. Well, that's getting down to the theological weeds at this point. So. <laughs> Which is fine. It's fine. That's fine. Well, what does Barbara Luttrell say? Well, what's, what's the definition of forever? Uh, <laughs> well, now you're getting into semantics. If, if you're talking forever, and you take it as word, he will always be there. He will always be there as our high priest. 
and why can't he be in more than one place at the same time? I, I don't think anybody's disagreeing with that. I but think if there's a second coming, won't we then be without sin at that point? And why do we need a high priest? And, and which is what I was assuming ultimately your question is, is getting us toward. But the millennium, when he comes back to the thousand year reign of Christ, uh, don't be, have to be, he'll be a judge then and he'll not. Apparently, we'll be judging angels as well. Believers will be. So we'll be. Uh, He'll still be a judge. He'll still be high priest, but I don't think it really, his position ever stops. He stays the same. I don't know if he'll be high priest up there, or maybe you know, we'll need a, a listening ear then as well as now. But I don't know. I don't think we'll know when we're there anyway. We'll know, we won't know when we pass him, but we're there. We'll remember him at all. I would, I, think, I would think we'll still be learning. Oh, yeah. So there's yeah. still going to be a hierarchy, which means that he'll still, still be at the right hand of God. It'll be different. We'll be in our our new beings, but doesn't it say in the Bible that you reap more, you build up your... Okay, tell us, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what? <laughs> tell us the answer. Well, let's simplify the question, because <laughs> you, you all are really going out broad. Uh, I think I mentioned this last week where... Uh, uh, Charlie Brown is on the, the, the baseball mound and his team gathers around him. They start having a, this theological discussion and he said, I don't have a baseball team. I have a theological seminary. Uh, <laughs> kind of feels that way with you all, which is a good thing because I wasn't expecting the premillennial and the amillennial and the postmillennial issues to come up. But let's simplify it. it. Before, well, after Jesus comes, gathers us up, there's a new heaven and a new earth. And we are there with him. How many of you think Jesus will still be high priest interceding on our behalf? So a majority of you. So is everybody else a no? You're a no. So uh, since, because we no longer have sin, we have no longer the need for a priestly intercession? Right. Okay. You really want my answer? I don't know. <laughs> but I have to kind of go along the lines of what Kermit said. This is a perpetual priesthood. There's no indication that will it will end. I think it will transition. If there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and there's still going to be a heavenly sanctuary, we will still have a great high priest who intercedes on our behalf, but maybe not in the way that he needs to now, which is the best I can give you. I think you're absolutely right. We don't have the need for a priest to intercede on our behalf to the Father because of sin at that time. But there's no indication that this high priesthood will ever end. I just think it's going to mean something different. What exactly that means, I don't know. So what are the other high priestly duties? Of Jesus? Uh, in the heavenly sanctuary, it's basically interceding on our behalf. Uh, he, he heard our requests this morning. He has gathered them up, and he has, he's, he has discussed them with the Father, for lack of a better term. Um, sacrifices? No. Nope. Once for all. That one's come and done. So in the justice system that was set up uh, in the old law under Moses, uh, so you had the, uh, the, the prophet, and you had the judge, and then you had the high priest as like, I, I, I equate it to like the Supreme Court. That, so the high priest in a situation of conflict, a problem, uh, he's the last word. He is the one that says, this is how the cow licks the calf and that's it, okay? And so that to me is the way it is in this time that we're in. I personally believe that the pandemic is a plague. I personally believe the reason why the world hasn't gotten much more relief than it has is because we haven't done what it says in Second Chronicles 7 and 14. And so we are being we are going through this judgment, and uh, what we presented is not good enough uh, for yet for the, the, the high priest is making this, in my opinion, uh, determination. You haven't turned away from the idols. You haven't turned away from the wicked ways. You haven't turned to me. 
So I'm going to continue to have this judgment on you until you do what it says that you need to do. And I have the last word because I'm the high priest. I'm the last one to make that decision. Okay. Sounds good. No disagreement. Jesus was a teacher too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so what's to say that he's not? When we get to heaven, we don't know what's in heaven. We're going to have to be taught what's what's there. So he'll be instead of interceding for us our forgiveness, it could be he's back to a teacher to teach us what we need in our heavenly state, mm -hmm. which would still mean that he would be a higher level, and he'll always will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he will always be the Son. He will always be the second person of the Trinity. He will always be God. Um, and I think he will always be high priest. I think he will always have some sort of mediatorial function uh, between us and the Father. I, I think it's going to be uh, something that uh, you had mentioned last week. It's going to be cl more clear. It's going to be clearer. It, it will be, there was going to be a better understanding of what that means. But I think you're also right, uh, maybe because I'm an educator and I kind of lean in that direction uh, more easily, Every time Jesus talked about heaven, he always said, the kingdom of heaven is like. And I think it was his way of saying, you all don't know. I know because I've been there. And I'm going to tell you about it as best I can, but I have to use metaphors and similes because you just don't know until you're there. And when you're, you're there, you will start to understand. I think there's going to be growth and development that, had, that does occur. Not like here. It's going to be a different thing. It's going to be a different type of understanding. One thing you always need to keep in mind, the relationships that we have now will be there, only different. My relationship with my wife is not going to disappear. I don't know if she's still going to be my wife, but we will still share, I think, in a different relationship than I do with other people. And the same thing with parents and children and all of that. Because the things that cloud our relationship on this earth won't be there. It's going to be different, and to use a good uh, Hebrews word, it's going to be better. And I don't know what that means. I think a key word you used was transitional. I feel like it's always going to be in flux, and whatever it becomes, whether you know whether we need Jesus to intercede on us or not, be at at that point. Uh, it's still going to be whatever is there, it's going to be on our behalf. Mm -hmm. He's always going to be working for us. Because he knows the Father and the Father knows him. And even then, we won't know the Father as well as he does. You know, it's kind of like if, if you've met me for the first time and you want to know about Carla, then you'll ask me and I'll tell you, I'll teach you about Carla, who she is, the same thing with her. And, and that those people that you've had long-term relationships with that, you've, that you can tell other people about that you have short-term relationships with, it's going to be like that, I think. But at the end of the day, I don't know. I know what it's not going to be like. It's not going to be like in the TV shows and the movies where we're swinging around where, with angels' wings. I know the, the whole uh, it's a wonderful life. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings and all that. Uh, we will not become angelic folks. Uh, <clears throat> Anyway, um, in that second verse, the, the second thing, that, he, that point that he wants to get across, we, we have this high priest, and he's ministering for us, and there's a phrase that's used there. I, it's often translated this way, in the true tabernacle. Does everybody have true tabernacle or something other than true? What does he mean by true tabernacle? What's he talking about here? What is the true tabernacle? I believe that uh, the true tabernacle is this temple. There's a place in the Bible that says, present your body a holy sacrifice. But this is really where the spirit of the Lord dwells. And I think that the true tabernacle is actually the uh, embodiment, the embodiment of the spirit that was in um, Yahshua the Christ Jesus as he came in the human being. So I think the true tabernacle is him, number one, as it teaches us to have that capacity as the Holy Spirit indwells us. Okay. 
Anyone else? What he might mean about the true tabernacle? It's our, ourselves, I think, are you the tabernacle. Okay. I think that it's not that tent that they carried around the desert, and not those two buildings that were put over there in, in the Holy Land, but it's the real one up in heaven. It's that one. Um, the Greek word that's used here, true, it's, off, it's best translated, that which truly is. It's the real thing, he's, he's saying. The real tabernacle. The real heavenly temple. Where God really lives. Where God really lives. Where he dwells today. Where the Father is, uh, or excuse me, where the Son is sitting at, or standing at his right hand. There, that thing. And he's going to start developing that concept here over the next just few verses. That he's, um, now there is that imagery that is often conveyed that we are the, the, the heavenly building. I think it's in Ephesians. Paul uses the idea that we, we are the building blocks uh, of that uh, uh, heavenly tabernacle. And, and it's because there's a sense of participation within it. But there is a heavenly tabernacle that is described and discussed actually in the book of Exodus that he's gonna pull out in a verse here in a moment. Um, but it's it's the real one he's saying. And if he was, if the author of Hebrews was from Texas, he's be, he would be saying it's the real one, y'all. Uh, it's it's that main one. Uh, it's, not, it's not the big fancy tent that they carried around in the desert. It's not the two buildings in Jerusalem. It's the real one. It's the one that truly is. Which is an idea, This I thought this was interesting. That's not really, a, uh, the idea of a heavenly sanctuary, a heavenly tabernacle, is not really unique to the author of Hebrews. It was very common in first century Judaism. So his, his congregation would have immediately clicked to that, as he, that concept of a heavenly tabernacle. So he's not presenting a new, a, a new concept, he's presenting a new and better way of understanding concept that was very prevalent. If you were to stop, um, a member of the Sanhedrin and say, is there a heavenly tabernacle? Yeah, sure, no problem. The Essenes, the, uh, um, the Sadducees, they have a base, basically all had a concept of a heavenly tabernacle. There, there's, there's the temple in Jerusalem, but then there's one up in heaven where God is, where he resides. But the author of Hebrews is coming along and saying, you're right, there is, but let me tell you about the real, real heavenly tabernacle. It's not what Judaism has a tendency to think of. Could somebody read verse 3? For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that the high priest also has something to offer. That's a strange little verse, which kind of sounds uh, simple. And for the most part, it is. He's basically saying high priests offer gifts and sacrifices as a function of their office. That's what they do, among a myriad of other things. But they, the Levitical high priests, they bring sacrifices into the Holy of Holies. They perform the, the uh, uh, sacrificial uh, uh, aspect of worship in order to intercede on the people's behalf. And he's basically, the author is basically saying, so what about the ministry of the new heavenly high priest of the order of Melchizedek? Now, the author of Hebrews doesn't state what Jesus' sacrifice and ministry is until actually chapter 9, verse 14. Uh, he just briefly mentions in regard to the shedding of Christ's blood, the blood of Christ, uh, that that's the sacrifice that he made. Um, but he will develop building up to that point, uh, further the, uh, the uh, idea of the contrast between the old worship and the new worship, the old covenant, the new uh, covenant, the old sanctuary, the new sanctuary. And, and that verb uh, of to offer, this may not mean a whole lot to you, but it's an aorist subjunctive. That should be important. Uh, now, just hold on. We're just, we do very little Greek here, but every once in a while we do a little Greek. What that means is it happened one time in the past, and that's it. And he's telling his congregation, there will be no repeated sacrifices. Our great high priest has sacrificed once for all. That's it. No more needed. No other sacrifices need be made. No further revelation. No continual high priestly uh, office will be offered up. One high priest, one sacrifice. That's it. We're done. So where in the sentence is that verb? 
It is, at least in my English translation, it's at the end, um, that this high priest also has something to offer. It sounds future in English. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, but it's not in Greek. Okay. That's part of the reason why I highlighted it. Because uh, I looked at a couple of other translations and I thought, well, that doesn't sound like an aorist. It doesn't sound like a past tense thing. But it's one time. It's a one-time event. It happened one time and then that's it. And his audience, his congregation would clearly have heard. It, it's, in other words, it's not a participle. It's not a continual, all, ongoing thing. It's he not is, a shell. Yeah, he, he, not it's not will, it's shall, it's not futuristic, and it's not continual ongoing. He is offering, he's continually offering up sacrifices. He's offered up himself as a sacrifice, and that's it. He's done with that. No more. He has other functions, such as interceding on our behalf, but we need have no further sacrifices. This is part of the reason why you always need to keep this in the back of your mind in, in regard to Hebrews. This is part of the argument of you, congregation, can't drift back into Judaism. You can't keep doing the animal sacrifices. It does you no good. We've had a greater sacrifice. We have a greater high priest. We have a greater sanctuary. We have a greater covenant. We have a greater, big, bigger, better, superior of everything. So drifting back is drifting back into the inferior. Not the bad. It's not good and bad contrast. Uh, we, we always need to keep that in mind as well. This is not a contrastive, it's comparative between the old covenant and the new covenant, the old priesthood and the new priesthood, the old sacrifices and the new sacrifice. And by the way, as a sideline, part of the problem with Judaism in the first century, and to a certain extent before and since then, is that they focus too much on the, the ritualism, mm. that the animal sacrifice is what made all the difference. That's something that was supposed to be an expression of people's coming to God and pleading, and, and they would express their worship through the animal sacrifice. But if you remember what Samuel told Saul in 1 Samuel, obedience is better than sacrifice. You can sacrifice animals all day long, but what God wants is the restoration and reconciliation of the relationship between he and his people, which was expressed in the worship. So... If you need a, an immediate parallel, you can sing hymns and attend worship service all day long, every day of the week. That's not what makes the difference. That's supposed to be an expression of, of the relationship that we have with God. Uh, I love God so much, and I'm so grateful to Him. I want to sing praises to Him in the body of Christ. Uh, I want to uh, you know, gather up a prayer request, and I want to hear sermon. I want to do those things. It's not a matter of, well, I've ticked all the boxes. I've heard the sermon today. And I brought my Bible. I tithed. I did those things, and that's what makes the difference. Those are supposed to be expressions of the relationship. Judaism never really got that. The temple didn't make the difference. The temple was not God. The scriptures don't make a difference. I know that's hard for us to hear, but remember, there's only three persons of the Trinity, and the scripture is not part of that. The Bible is not God. It's God's word. It's an expression of who God is, and it's not to be an object of worship. So they don't quite get that it's, it's not the things that make the difference. It's the relationship that is supposed to be expressed through those things. Did Question. You? Yes? Uh, in Genesis, oh my gosh. does it not say... <laughs> I don't know if she's cornered me. I'm not trying to corner you at all. I just <laughs> want to know what I'm saying. Uh, it, it, doesn't it say that uh, in the beginning was the word? Well, it's and John 1.1. 1, 1. Okay, it does not say in the No, it says in the beginning, but uh, in, the beginning, in the beginning, God, God created. Yeah, God. yeah. They were sheep by cry of a They were? In the beginning, God created. Okay. I was speaking in tongues. Okay, well, I don't it want was, to say the wrong thing, so I am um, standing to be corrected because maybe I'm thinking of John. Where it says uh, the word logos. Mm -hmm. But what uh, it's using the uh, word word logos for uh, the second person of the Trinity, not for the scriptural word of God. It's a new concept for me, so I've got to digest that. Uh, John in the first chapter is basically telling his audience. That concept of logos or word 
It's not what you folks think is. it is. It's not the wisdom of God. It's not the teachings of God. It is God in the second person of the Trinity, the Son, who is God. Okay. So word is another term for who Jesus is and what he does. Thank you. Rather than the Bible itself. The only other thing that I, I, I want to ask you is like in the very beginning uh, in the Garden of Eden, when the uh, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, mm -hmm. and that that broke the relationship that they had, did not wasn't an animal killed, mm -hmm. so there was blood. Blood was shed so that they could have uh, clothing to cover their right. sin or their nakedness. So was that the first kind of establishment of blood being sacrificed of, uh, when we? For the sacrificial offering, was that kind of the basis for how the Jews uh, attained that tradition? It's kind of a, an echo of the, the future animal sacrifices, that something has to happen as a result of this brokenness to try and, as much as possible, begin restoring the brokenness. Uh, anyway, could somebody read verse 4? Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. Sorry, we got to do a little more Greek again. This is a second-class conditional sentence, a statement contrary to fact. What he's saying is, now, if he were on earth, and he's not, he would not be a priest at all, and he is. He's trying to draw a parallel between the fact that earthly high priests perform their ministry in the earthly sanctuary. He's not here. He is in heaven, first of all. And secondly, the heavenly sanctuary is the only place he can perform his duties because as we saw in chapter seven, he's not of the order of the Aaronic priests. And in other words, he's not of the tribe of Levi. Therefore, according to the law, he has no right or authority to perform the duties of a high priest on earth. But as, a mem as the only member of the order of Melchizedek, as a result of his death, burial, and resurrection, he is a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and therefore has the ability to perform those functions. Now, in his uh, earthly ministry, nobody would have ever recognized him as a high priest. Nobody would have ever said, so when is it, your, uh, what year are you going to be performing your high priestly duties? Kind of like in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, whenever he goes off and he, he's supposed to perform that one time, the high priestly duties, it was something that it was kind of an honor as well as a responsibility that was given to members of the, the tribe of Levi, which he was. And while he's there, he's told, oh, you're going to have a child. And he says, no, this is not going to happen. And then the uh, angel Gabriel says, well, your mouth will be shut until you uh, write his name, until you declare what his name. In other words, until you believe, nobody's going to hear from you. Um, he was performing high priestly duties. Jesus would have never have done that. He was of the tribe of Judah. He was a lay person. He was not a priest. Therefore, his priestly duties would never have occurred here on earth in the earthly sanctuary. His high priestly duties would have only have occurred in the heavens, in the, in the heavenly sanctuary, where he was of the order of Melchizedek. And nobody... Well, I say nobody. Very few within Judaism, with, at least within Jewish leadership, would have ever recognized his high priestly status. Um, and and I, I think this is kind of a, a way of demonstrating that. If you remember in Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches a, a nice sermon uh, to the Jews in Jerusalem, of which a lot of them were Jewish leaders. And um, they, they, they get angry with him because he's laying out the gospel message and who Jesus was and his uh, duties and functions and, and all of that. Um, and then he, he uh, states in Acts 7, 56, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, which he literally did. That, that was too much for the Jewish leaders and for the Jewish people. They picked up rocks and stoned him to death because that was excessive blasphemy, because the Jesus that he had been talking about, he is now telling them, I see him in the heavenly sanctuary, standing at the Father's right hand, interceding on my behalf, doing things that no earthly high priest could ever do. And that was too much for them. They had to kill him because that was blasphemy. There's only one high priest, 
and it's an earthly high priest. And what Stephen was declaring in that one phrase at the end of his sermon, which is what, uh, what the author of Hebrews is declaring, is that we have a heavenly high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. And his duties are continual and ongoing, and he's there right now. And he is far and above the Levitical high priest. That was just too much for those in Jerusalem, um, including, by the way, the future apostle Paul, who was there listening to the sermon. If you remember that scene, um, his name was Saul at the time. But those that were wanting to throw rocks at Stephen, they let they they gave their cloaks and their robes to uh, uh, Saul so that he could hold on to them, uh, so it wouldn't. Um, bind up their arms as they threw rocks at Stephen and killed him, which means he was giving a thumbs up to the whole situation, to the whole scene. He agreed with what was happening to this heretic, Stephen, and then, you know, he comes over and joins the other side. So the, the author of Hebrews is uh, describing a priesthood that is confined to an earthly sanctuary as inferior, and the heavenly priesthood is superior because by its very nature, it's in a heavenly uh, sanctuary, not in an earthly one. Could somebody read verse 5? Who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For, see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee, showed to thee in the mouth. Um, four and five obviously are connected. Uh, the author of Hebrews has just mentioned the Levitical priests who perform their duties, their sacrifices according to the law. And then he says, and those Levitical priests serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. A lot of translations have uh, heavenly things. Um, those things which are sanctified, something along those lines. What do you think the author of Hebrews means by a copy and a shadow? Why is he using those terms to describe uh, the earthly sanctuary that the Levitical priests serve in, the temple, in other words? Why a copy? Why a shadow? Because it's not nearly as good as the real thing in heaven. It's not nearly as good as the real thing in heaven. That's it. That's a very apt way of, of uh, developing the one term that the author of Hebrews often uses, better. It's better. The earthly one is not better. It's just not as good. It is a copy, therefore it is an imitation. Intentionally built, intentionally designed according to the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, it kind of comes out if you start reading between the lines, not really reading between the lines, but if you uh, really start to develop the concept that the author of Hebrews is conveying when he quotes this passage from Exodus twenty five forty about uh, see that you make it, it uh, see that you make well in the Hebrew it says that you make it according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. It leaves the impression that Moses actually was shown a vision of the heavenly tabernacle was told this is the pattern by which you are to follow the Hebrew word is hebnet or in Greek tupon this typology this pattern. Follow this pattern, and then throughout the rest of Exodus 25 and into the next chapter, he's given verbal instructions on the design and the organization. But the first thing he's given is a visual image of it, we think. It seems to be. And that visual image is uh, an image of the real, uh, that which truly is heavenly tabernacle. And he's told, make a copy of it. Make an imitation of it. It's not the real thing. It's not the heavenly sanctuary. You will not be building the heavenly sanctuary here on earth. The heavenly sanctuary will not descend. That's a revelation uh, the, where that image of the, the heavenly sanctuary comes down to the city. Um, it is a copy and also a shadow. Why do you think he uses the word shadow? It's not just simply a copy or an imitation. He intentionally uses the word shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Why shadow? Shadow is a reflection of the light on some other object. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's a reflection of the, the um, light of uh, the Father, the Son, that is being reflected on this thing that's not as good, but it's being, it's a reflection of that. Okay, that's a good point. Anyone else? Why shadow? 
but it sounds similar to the idea of uh, now we see through a, a dirty lens, and then That's we will see clearly. I kind of equate the, um, the impure vision uh, as that of a shadow. Not the same thing. It, it's not, it's kind of like with the copy uh, word, it's not the thing itself. Obviously, if you have, if there's a tree and the sun is shining and you see the shadow of the tree, it's not the tree. But the shadow comes and goes. It's not, ultimately, it's not real. It's, it's ephemeral. It's passing. It's temporal. But it's a representation of the real thing. It is a representation of the real thing. And it's meant to be a representation of the weird, real thing. It's not, you can't, uh, you view those two words of copy and shadow uh, uh, as it's not important, doesn't really matter. It's more a matter of it is an imitation and it is passing, but it has a function and it, it's real to a point in serving its purpose. So Go ahead. It's also dependent. It, it is dependent. It doesn't exist without the other. Exactly. That's a, a good idea to uh, convey at this point. It's not the real thing, but you wouldn't have the earthly tabernacle without the heavenly tabernacle. So there's a, a there's a connection, there's a dependence upon it. Stop short of being a counterfeit. It's not a counterfeit, that's true. Uh, so it, it that has a sense of being a fraud. Right. And, it, and it's not fraudulent. It has a purpose. It has a meaning. It has a purpose. Uh-huh. But that's neither here nor there when you're talking about the legitimate. You might call it a knockoff. Which in the fashion world is very much like it, but mm -hmm. not exactly. It mm -hmm. may not shine quite as well. Mm -hmm. It may not have all the frills quite as well, but it serves the same purpose. It looks a whole lot like it. It's the closest you can get. That being real thing. It's kind of a heavenly knockoff, for lack of a better term, which I know has kind of a sense of it being a fraud as well, but you usually know, you usually know going into buying the knockoff that it's not the real thing. Part of the problem with Judaism in the first century is they think it's the real thing. They think the temple is it, that that's all there is. And the author of Hebrews is coming along. That's why he doesn't use the word temple. He comes along and says, no, that thing in Jerusalem, it's a copy, it's a shadow. The worship that's connected to it, it's a copy and a shadow. The sacrifices that are connected to it, it's a copy and a shadow. It's not the real thing itself. What's interesting, this quote that he pulls from Exodus 20, 40, it's from the Septuagint, and I won't make you do the Septuagint here, but not in the Septuagint and not in the Hebrew text is the, uh, in English, the words, all things. The author of Hebrews adds that in rather than it. In, in the Hebrew and the Greek, it, it, what it's really saying is that uh, see that you make it, that is your earthly sanctuary, according to the pattern of the heavenly sanctuary. The author of Hebrews adds in all, or all things, as a way of gathering up everything connected to the earthly temple, to the earthly uh, tabernacle, the rituals, the sacrifices, the priests, the robes, the vestment, the basin, the lampstand, all of that stuff, all of it is coming and going, serving its purpose and its function, and then it's over with, because now Jesus has come. We have a new high priest, we have a new covenant, we have new worship, we have a new tabernacle. And we don't necessarily have to wait to be there because someone is there on our behalf now and forever and always. Could somebody read verse 6? But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator, is superior to the old one is founded on better promises. There's a couple of betters in here that he brings in. Better covenant, better promises. Um, so Jesus' earthly ministry is superior, uh, heavenly ministry is superior to the earthly ministry of the Levitical priests. And his ministry is based upon a better covenant, a better relationship, a better contract between God and humanity uh, in which uh, Jesus is the guarantor that comes in from Hebrews chapter 7 verse 22 and then here mediator. The term mediator in Greek is a business term. You've got two people that want to strike a business deal and they can't work things out. They bring in a mediator who communicates on behalf of the other two. 
sometimes to the benefit of one over the other, but in this context, there's this ethical quality to Christ's mediation in which he gets uh, in the contract, he achieves everything that the Father wants, and he achieves everything that humanity wants. He gives everything to everybody in his mediation. In other words, God the Father doesn't win out over us and get more than we do, and vice versa. We don't get more than the Father does. Everybody gets what they need, what they desire, what they want in the relationship. He achieves everybody's functions and purposes. I'm a Texas certified mediator. There's probably lawyers or something easier. But uh, as a mediator, you don't arbitrate, like you're saying. You don't, you know, Dunning and Jill, um, you don't say, well, Dunning, this is what you really should do. I heard what Jill said, and I don't think what she wants is realistic. You ask Johnny, you ask Jill. Then you, you really actually open up a conversation between them, which they have not been able to have before because they were at each other. So the mediator sits there and says, I'm not trying to solve this for you. I'm not trying to solve this for you. I want you to come to an agreement, and I'm only here to help you to come to an agreement on what is equitable for both of you. So I guess that's kind of like what you were saying. About what Jesus does. Yeah, basically the father is saying, well, Jesus is asking the father, what do you want? And he says, I want the best relationship possible with my people. And his people are being asked, well, what do you want? I want the best possible relationship with the father. And Jesus says, I can make it happen. Everybody wins. Nobody loses in this covenant, except those who refuse to recognize it or those who are drifting back. So he's mediating on behalf of, of both, but not in favor of one or, or the other, over the other. Even though, remember, he is God, he is also humanity. He understands us, he connects to us, he knows what we need, he understands our feelings, he knows what we desire, and he's achieving that through his mediation uh, between the, the Father and us. Still is doing that, still continuing, that's still going on without fail. And this is based upon better, the better covenants, based upon better promises. He doesn't really give a full expression to the better promises, that's probably what he's going to be dealing with what, with what we'll look at next week, verses 8 through 13, where he, if, you, if your Bible is kind of like mine, there's a lot of Old Testament quote here. It's Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Those are probably the better promises that he means at this point. And then that last verse, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. This is another one of those second-class conditional sentences, a statement contrary to fact. For if that first covenant had been faultless, and it was, it was faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second, and there was. In other words, the first one didn't quite work out, and so a second one needed to come along. The old one wasn't working. We need to be careful with that concept because it's not a matter of God created a flawed system. He, he's not saying that. What he's saying is it wasn't working because God's people were not responding to the things that they were supposed to be responding to. Part of that idea of, a hev of an earthly tabernacle, the ultimate purpose behind that was not to get uh, the Hebrew people to focus so much on the earthly tabernacle that they could never see the heavenly tabernacle. The point was to understand that this replica is supposed to cause you to turn your eyes upward and focus more on the earth, uh, the heavenly tabernacle. And the problem was Judaism was too focused upon the rituals, the animal sacrifices, the Levitical priesthood, and the earthly sanctuary. And God had had enough, and it was time to move on, uh, to bring down that, um, that heavenly tabernacle with a heavenly priesthood to try and restore the relationship between God and humanity the way that God had intended it all along. So it's not as though the old covenant was flawed. This is, as I mentioned before, this is not a matter of bad and good, old and new. It's not contrastive. The old covenant is bad and it, it failed and God did away with it. It's a matter, it's more of a comparative rather than a contrastive. It's good, old covenant, and better. New covenant. Old priesthood, good. New priesthood, better. Old worship, good. New worship, better. And that's been the plan all along. So God didn't mess up. God did not create a, a covenantal relationship and a type of worship and uh, a, a 
a, uh, an, an earthly tabernacle that just, you know, th this one didn't work out. I guess I'll try plan B. There is no plan B. This is all plan A. This has been God's plan all along. To try and cause his people to see him in the heavenly tabernacle, not in the earthly tabernacle only. To try and get them to think in upward, uh, in an upward manner, in a heavenly manner. Um, like the hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. One of the things, I know this is kind of strange, but one of the things that came to mind is Dante's Divine Comedy, each of the three major parts, hell, par uh, purgatory, and heaven, all literally end with the same word, stars. Because it's believed it was Dante's intention for you to read this long poem, and then the last word you hear is stars. And then you read another long poem, and the last word you read is stars, to get people's eyes to look heavenward. That was the point of the earthly tabernacle, to get humanity to look heavenward and not to be too focused upon the earthly. Because this is, even today, 2,000 years later, this is not all that there is. The church is supposed to be heaven on earth, but what it will be is going to be better because we have a better high priest, we have a better covenant, we have a better tabernacle that we will worship in. Better worship, better everything. It's, and how that's gonna be, I don't know. And the full function of Jesus as high priest, I don't know. The details, I'll leave to him. The rest is about preparing for that. Because uh, what is also supposed to be taking place in Judaism and tabernacle and temple worship is preparation for uh, full-time eternal worship. That's what we're doing now. We are preparing for eternity. Or as William Blake said, we are preparing for flight. That's what we need to do. That's why I think what Tim said earlier is absolutely right. We're gonna be learning that we are not gonna have it all down. Um, and how that's gonna function and take place, I don't know. I'm not worried about it. We will have a purpose in the next life. We will have a purpose when we are with the Father in heaven. And how it's all gonna play out, I don't know. But we need to be prepared for that and not drift back. Kind of run out of time, so I guess if you have questions, I apologize. I hate to be one of those type of teachers that says, hold all questions until the end and don't give you any time to answer or ask, but we do need to go. So let me close with a prayer. Father, we are thankful and grateful for the fact that we have a high priest who still ministers on our behalf, who hears us, who cares, and that is in conversation with you even now expressing the, the cares and the concerns and the fears and the joy that we have to you. We will always have that because we will always have Christ and we will always have a relationship with you. Help us to continue in that relationship with one another and with you as we enter into this time of worship. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Thanks for those of you online. Thank you.